Hey there, this is Neil Davis from Digital Cloud Training. In this series of short videos, I'm going to walk you through some practice exam questions from my AWS Certified Developer Associate Practice Exam course. And what I'm going to do is walk you through my thought process. So how do I go about working out which answer or answers are correct? And how do I work out which answers are definitely incorrect? And I've been doing IT examinations for over 20 years, so I've got quite a bit of experience. And I want to try and use that to sort of teach you a few techniques so that when you go and sit your exam, you've got a much greater chance of success. So I hope you find it valuable. See you in the videos. And this one is a developer has created an Amazon API gateway with caching enabled in front of AWS Lambda. And for some requests, it's necessary to ensure the latest data is received from the endpoint. How can the developer ensure the data is not stale? So we've got API gateway, it's sitting in front of a Lambda function, and it's got caching enabled. So the key thing here is there's going to be information from Lambda that gets put in the cache and then served through Amazon API gateway. So we need to then sort of build that picture in our mind and then think, OK, so what is the issue that we're trying to avoid here? And that is that for some requests, it's necessary to ensure the latest data is received. So we've got Lambda, we've got the API gateway, data from Lambda is getting cached. And we need to make sure that sometimes when we go to our API gateway, we get the latest data. So not necessarily the cache data. So the problem is that we have data in the cache, which is great for some circumstances. But in this one, we need to make sure we got the latest data. This, the data in Lambda might have been updated or wherever the Lambda function is pulling that data from. So what's the best way to do this? So firstly, let's look at this option. The cache must be disabled. Well, of course, you could do that. You could disable the cache and then you would make sure that the data is not stale. But is that the best thing you can do? In you know, we have actually been asked here that for some requests, it's necessary to ensure the latest data is received, not all requests. So that would be a very global thing. That would mean that all requests basically will get the latest data and that will lower the performance potentially for um, your application because things are not being read from the cache. So the next one here is modify the time to live on the cache to a lower number. So that will mean that the items that get put into the cache only exist there for a shorter period of time, the time to live. Now that's good and that will help, but it's not going to ensure that the latest data is received. And we've been told to ensure that the latest data is received, not try to get the latest data. So in this case, I don't think that's going to work because it's not going to guarantee that we get the latest data. Of course, you could put the number really, really low and then it would reduce the risk of getting stale data, but then you reduce the effectiveness of your cache as well. So that wouldn't really work. So we're finally left with these two that look fairly similar. So we've got the send requests with the cache delete max age equals zero header and the send requests with the cache control max age equals zero header. And this is one of these fact-based things. You know, it's not necessarily obvious which one it is. You kind of have to know it. So I know that the way that you can invalidate objects in the cache is you send this information in the header. So cache control max age equals zero in the header. And then it will invalidate any cached objects and pull down the latest data for you. And the cache delete is not the correct header. So you need to know the difference between these. And this will come up a few times in practice questions. So hopefully you'll definitely know this by the time you sit your exam. So this is the one I'm going for. Let's choose check. And sure enough, that's the correct answer. We can actually see a little image here of configuring the cache where you can specify the time to live and so on. And so that's definitely the right answer is to send requests with the cache control max age equals zero. So moving on to question four. So this question says a company is deploying an on-premise application server that will connect to several AWS services. What is the best way to provide the application server with permissions to authenticate AWS services? So the key thing to note here straight away is we've got a company deploying an on-premise server. So we should stop thinking about EC2. We're not talking about EC2 here. This is a server on-premises, so in some customer's data center somewhere. And that server needs to connect to AWS services. 
So we can straight away think of a couple of ways that you'd be able to do this. And the first one that comes to mind is you've probably configured the AWS CLI on your workstation or your laptop, and you've done so by running AWS configure, and you've supplied an access key ID and a secret access key. And you've probably supplied an access key and a secret ID. And that then gave you the ability to use the AWS CLI to connect to AWS services so you can authenticate and access AWS services. Now, the other way you could potentially do it is to use the AWS SDK and you might want to assume a role. So let's have a look at what the options are that are available to us here. The first option is create an IAM role with the necessary permissions and assign it to the application server. Of course, if we were thinking about EC2, that would probably be the most secure and the best practice option where we can create a instance profile and assign the role to the instance profile. And the EC2 server would then be able to access AWS services by assuming that role. But we're talking about an on-premises server. So there's no way you can do that with an on-premises server. So you can't assign an IAM role to an application server. Now in code, you could assume a role, but that's not what it's saying here. The next one is to create an IAM user and generate access keys create a credentials file on the application server. So if you'll remember when you run AWS configure, you then have a credentials file created locally and the access key and secret ID are actually stored in that credentials file in plain text, which is why it's not the most secure option, but they're, they're actually stored there. So that sounds like a very viable option. That sounds to me like the best answer. The next one is to create an IAM group with the necessary permissions and add the on-premise application server to the group. Well, firstly, you don't really assign permissions to a group. It could mean that you've got a permissions policy and you sign the policy to the group and that works and you can put users in the group and that's a best practice way of providing permissions to users. But you can't add an on-premise application server to a group. So that's not gonna work. And the last is to create an IAM user and generate a key pair and use the key pair in API calls to AWS services. Now, it's very confusing sometimes, but the key pair is completely different to the access key and secret ID. So the key pair is what you download when you first launch an EC2 instance, and it's the way that you can then connect and authenticate to your EC2 instance, but it's not used to connect to other, other AWS services. So that looks incorrect. So I'm gonna go and choose this second option here and choose check, and sure enough, that is the correct answer and you've got a bit more information here. You can see on Windows, that's where your credentials file would be stored, and on Linux, it would be there.